Thank you for inviting me and also inviting me to uh, organize this session. So we are back uh, with the session that uh, started on Wednesday with uh, Luigi Malago's uh, fantastic talk, who gave an overview of uh, neural networks approaches and their relation to information geometry. Unfortunately, Ferro disappeared and asked me to extend my talk and we were planning to actually share uh, this presentation. So ex I extended it a little bit uh, by uh, three slides that come directly at the beginning. So they are not, that's, that is uh, what I not wanted to talk about in my, in my presentation. <laughs> so let me start. It's basically in motivation of information geometry. Um, motivation of the main structures in information geometry. So I started actually with information geometry by studying this example. I considered a very simple case, two binary nodes um, with states 0 and 1. The composition, the, the uh, product, uh, uh, I considered the product space and the uh, simplex of all probability distributions on that product space. So it has, of course, the extreme points uh, given by the Dirac measures, uh, delta 0, 0, delta 1, 0, delta 0, 1, and delta 1, 1. Now you can, you can consider a sub, uh, subfamily of this simplex, namely the family of all distributions that uh, factorize, so for which the random variables x and y are independent. So it can be written in this way, p of x comma y equals, uh, I'm sorry, q of x comma y equals q of x times q of y. So, if you have an arbitrary probability distribution, I wanted to study projection onto this manifold by using a uh, distance measure. And I ended up with the kullback leibler divergence, where you measure the distance according to this, uh, to this formula. I started with many other uh, um, uh, distance measures, and they didn't work very well, in the sense that if you apply the kullback leibler divergence, you end up with the projection uh, being the product of the marginals, which is very natural, okay? Um, that was the, the first starting point, that I realized uh, uh, this. And then I compared this with uh, Hilbert space theory. There you project onto subspaces uh, by actually minimizing the L2 distance. That corresponds exactly to this situation here. But in Hilbert space theory, you have a different kind of projection, which is the geodesic projection, which I call geodesic projection. So you basically, if you have a subspace, you connect the point that you want to project with a point in the subspace, and you move that point until the uh, curve becomes, uh, gets orthogonal on, uh, on the uh, subspace. So orthogonality with, re with respect to the, to the uh, inner product of the Hilbert space. And it's well known that both kinds of projections, the distance-based projection and the geodesic projection, are equivalent. So can we do something similar here? If we want to do something similar, we need additional structures. First of all, we need the structure of uh, something that allows us to talk about orthogonality. And then we need the notion of geodesic, how to connect the point with the family. It turns out that we need also another notion of uh, geodesic, so that we have, uh, uh, we can talk about orthogonality of these two uh, curves here. And if you follow along these uh, ideas, you end up with the uh, uh, Fisher metric as the natural inner product, the mixture connection as the connection that gives you this geodesic here, and the E connection that uh, uh, is the connection that gives you this geodesic. So why is that natural? So first of all, the mixture connection is this simple, simple connection, uh, the mixture of two probability distributions, one minus t times p plus t times q. And this is kind of exponential mixture, but you have to renormalize in order to, uh, to um, project it back to the, to the simplex. And that's the exponential uh, geodesic. 
So it turns out that if you consider projections with these structures and define geodesic projections by using this, then it's equivalent to defining projections with respect to the kullback leibler divergence. And in this case, it turns out that the projection is exactly the product of the marginals. So again, we can extend this observation in Hilbert space theory where the geodesic projection equals the uh, distance projection to a more general setting. And that was, that was the motivation. So, and actually, this a triple here, the, uh, the uh, metric and the connection and uh, the mixture and exponential connection is the basic structure of information geometry. So you can consider this situation in a much more general setting. You can consider, uh, so that's the most uh, prominent uh, statistical model, the Gaussian distributions on R. So they are parameterized by two numbers, the mean value and the standard deviation, and somehow they form a family. So we can consider a general manifold uh, embedded in the simplex of all probability distributions on, on omega. Omega is an, is an abbreviation here for, omega, uh, for the measurable space. And uh, this is, of course, a subset of the uh, space of positive, uh, finite positive measures, and this is embedded in the uh, signed measures. So the, the reason why we do this is that this forms a, a Banach space. So we have a nice embedding of a manifold in, the, in a Banach space, and we can um, use the structure of the Banach space. So it turns out that they are quite, uh, so if we want to define structures here and pull them back, and consider them on the manifold in order to define the analog of the Fisher metric and uh, uh, the connections, then there are some problems here to define the, the, uh, uh, the structures uh, appropriately here. So what Amari did, he basically, cons uh, he did a thought experiment. He said, how would the structure look, look like if I if I would be able to pull it back and consider it on the manifold. So without actually constructing it here, because it's, it's quite difficult to do that. And this is, uh, this is uh, what, what you get. So you can define directly the Fisher matrix using this embedding uh, according to this uh, formula here. And you can define another uh, tensor by extending just by one additional factor here of the, of the uh, logarithm of the density. And uh, that's, uh, we refer to this as the amari chensov tensor. And with these two components, you can actually define the alpha connections, and in particular, the one and minus one connections, which give you the mixture and, and the exponential connection. So that's the general definition. And uh, later, people tried. Uh, uh, to construct the structure on the uh, infinite dimensional spaces. Uh, Giovanni Pistone is the one who, uh, who started this, and uh, many other uh, papers appeared after that. And uh, we are trying in our book, which actually is available, uh, already available as an ebook, and will be available in, uh, in September in a printed form. We are trying to incorporate all these approaches uh, in the construction of, of, of the, of the uh, metric and this tensor on this uh, more, uh, infinite dimensional space. So the question is now, why are these structures natural? Where do they come from? And we heard already several times uh, ch about Chensov. So the Chensov had a very simple idea, and it goes as follows. So let's consider the, uh, how to characterize the Fisher metric. So let's consider a, 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 a simplex uh, with three elementary events, a point in the simplex, and two tangent vectors. Okay. So you can embed that simplex in a higher dimensional simplex in the following way. You keep these two states, um, I think 
yeah, state number one, uh, number two, and state number three. You keep them. It's described by this mapping here. Two is mapped to two, and three is mapped to three with probability one. And you decompose the last, uh, the first state into two states, one A and one B, according to this formula here. So with probability one half, you go in in one A, and with probability one half, you go in one B. And this is a stochastic matrix. You don't have actually to choose one half and half, uh, one half. You can take other, um, other components here. And you see the simplex with respect to this stochastic matrix is mapped, the lower dimensional simplex is mapped uh, into a higher dimensional simplex. It's just an embedding. And um, you can require that uh, the inner product, um, the inner product of these two vectors is exactly the inner product in the higher dimensional simplex of the images of these, uh, these uh, uh, two tangent vectors. So that's the requirement. And this can be generalized. So that's the basic geometric idea. And you can consider a more general stochastic matrix and embedding of, uh, um, of the simplex with m elementary events into a simplex uh, with n elementary events which have this structure and you, you require that the tensor, the, um, the inner product remains uh, invariant. So that's his uh, uh, Chensov's, Chensov's um, definition or requirement. And it uh, turns out, so I'm not going into the details of this, it turns out that the uh, Fisher matrix is the only matrix that uh, pre uh, satisfies this condition. If you now go from uh, tensors of order two to tensors of order three, you get the Amari Chensov tensor as being the only tensor that satisfies this condition. If you then go to n equals four, it breaks down. So it doesn't hold anymore for n greater than or equal to four, but you can still characterize all tensors for any order. Um, in terms of this uh, invariance condition, and we provide this uh, uh, full characterization in our book, uh, and uh, not restricted to finite, uh, um, uh, finitely uh, many uh, elementary events, so for general measurable spaces. So that's the justification. So Luigi, in his talk, uh, said that one could, in the context of neural networks, one could think of uh, different geometric uh, um, structures, and they, many of them may perform um, equally well. Um, so people in information geometry refer to this uh, characterization as being important, and Amari uh, cho uh, has chosen the Riemannian matrix, the Fisher matrix, in order to define the natural gradient. So that's the justification. Whether or not this is a good justification, we don't know. So now let's come. Sorry, mm -hmm. could you back show again what do you find for, for three? For so it's basically, so that's the general structure. And you could extend by additional factors. That's a canonical tensor, but it's not specified by the invariance uh, uh, requirement, uh, starting with uh, n equals. Nothing satisfies the invariance requirement. No, this does satisfy, but it's not uniquely characterized. OK? OK. So I have to, uh, so actually um, Guido Montufa will come back to this characterization and uh, present uh, uh, joint work with uh, Johannes and uh, Guido on, uh, uh, on the characterization of the metric for uh, stochastic matrices, which, is, uh, which are quite important in the context of uh, uh, neural networks. So now let me come to to the uh, actual content of my talk. So we consider, we model actually an, a learning system uh, in terms of a causal diagram. So the learning system um, has a brain, so that's the controller, C, and there is this world, and the, the uh, controller or the brain interacts with the world through sensing and acting, okay? It perceives at each time step a sensor uh, measurements, 
and uh, compute some actuator values and send them to the actuators and they will have an effect on the world. So the world state changes from time t minus 1 to t based on the actuator values. And this way you, uh, you generate a, a trajectory in the world. So starting from, uh, from an initial state W0 and C0, you uh, generate trajectory in the world, which, and this trajectory, we associate with this trajectory the behavior of the system. In particular, we consider the body of the system not being part of, of uh, uh, not being uh, a part of C, but a part of W. So if you, the, the movements of an agent uh, will be um, visible in the world. So if you have to look in the world and to see the behavior. The behavior is something that takes place here. So the whole thing is defined in terms of Markov transition kernels, beta, which is the um, sensor kernel. This is the uh, internal dynamics. This is the policy, pi. And then we have alpha, which uh, describes the uh, evolution of the world in the context of uh, actuator values. So, as I said, these um, are Markov transition kernels. And uh, we uh, distinguish between intrinsic kernels, phi and pi, and extrinsic kernels, beta and alpha. So the system is equipped with beta and alpha, and, and they cannot be changed. You cannot, the, you cannot change how the world evolves. That's something that you have to face as an agent. So beta and alpha are constraints to the system. We refer to them as the embodiment of the system. And phi and pi can be modified. And the way they are modified is in terms of uh, synaptic connections in the brain. So if you, if you change uh, parameters in the, in the learning system, then the corresponding objects, the corresponding kernels that define the dynamics will also change. So that would be the intrinsic dynamics and that would be the policy. So if you want to change your policy, uh, that's associated with the chain of, uh, change of the uh, synaptic connections. The, the, evolution of, the evolution of the world, mm -hmm. W, is, is just under the action of the... No, no. Or it can be... No. It can be it's so if you don't have any action, you still have an evolution. It's captured by this arrow here. Okay, so you have a model to explain how the world evolved. We are using, you will see, we are using a, a physics engine which, uh, um, which actually respects the uh, laws of physics and describes the, the, so we can actually define system. You will see examples, okay? Um, so to summarize, the objects of interest are elements of spaces with a natural geometry, spaces of conditional probability measures. So as I said, these are all kernels or stochastic matrices. And the learning system is a parameterized geometric object, a neuromanifold, that inherits the natural geometric structure. So if I have a natural geometry for phi and pi, then uh, I, uh, then I can, the system can inherit that natural geometry within the sub-manifold generated by these uh, parameters uh, W. And the efficiency of learning strongly depends on its inherited geometry. That's the, uh, basically the uh, idea of the natural gradient method. Let me demonstrate this by some uh, simple example. That's a toy example. Let's consider a policy which receives three sensor values and uh, has uh, two actuator values. So this, the, it's completely characterized by three numbers between zero and one, so that you have a stochastic matrix here. So K, one minus K, L, uh, L one minus L, M, one minus M. So in other words, the uh, space of policies from three to two uh, are nothing but a hypercube. And here we have, uh, we show an, uh, the analog of an exponential family sitting in the polytope of all uh, policies from three to two. The same here with uh, um, four inputs and two outputs. Here we have four numbers. We have a hypercube of dimension four, which is uh, represented here in terms of a Schlegel diagram. And that's the exponential family, the analog of this exponential family. 
so the exponential family of product distributions that you have seen before is now translated to, to policies, to policy spaces. Can, can I have a question? Mm -hmm. So the model of the left is a two-dimensional model? No, it's not. It's, it's, uh, it's not. It's, both of them are two-dimensional. And I want to demonstrate uh, how, um, uh, how the natural gradient works here. So this is a simple example from reinforcement learning applied to MDPs. So the system directly uh, can see the, um, the world. So the world is uh, denoted by S here. It goes from S to S prime. So it sees the world state and performs an action. And this action has an effect so that the system, the world can go from S to S prime. And gamma is fixed. And you can change pi. Pi is the policy. And in reinforcement learning, you want to, to uh, maximize the expected reward, which is basically the mean value of the, of the rewards that you receive from, uh, uh, from uh, yeah, that you receive from the world. So this is a simple function. And let's consider this function uh, uh, in terms of, let's maximize that function by using uh, two kinds of gradients. One is the uh, natural gradient, and one is the canonical gradient in, the, in this coordinate system. That's the coordinate system. So we use this family. That's the family that I have shown before. We start, uh, and that's the coordinate system. This is the starting point in the coordinate system. And we will see the evolution of the uh, um, gradient um, a process based on the uh, Fisher metri metric and based on the canonical uh, metric. So let's, let's see it. So that's the Fisher metric, and that's the canonical metric, which is here uh, coming from R2. So you see, first of all, it's, it's much slower. The Fisher metric uh, allows us, to, the natural gradient allows us to go directly to the maximum. And you see this is a local maximum, and this is really the global maximum. So it performs much better. And if you see it, the same dynamics on the manifold itself, uh, it starts here. That's the point. You, it's hard to see. That's the same starting point. So that's the natural gradient, and that's the canonical gradient in Rn. So it reaches, it reaches the global maximum even if it's uh, it looks like being far away. So that's really a difference between the two. Uh, so there it seems to be something special with the, with the Fisher metric for optimization. And referring to Luigi's talk, he, uh, uh, so he was uh, referring to, um, to advantages in overcoming plateaus. Here we don't have any plateaus. So that's really a parameterization of the system, and we just optimize no plateaus. And uh, still, there is a big difference. So there are more advantages than just overcoming plateaus. So let me now, so the exponential families that the, I have shown to you are, are defined in uh, uh, completely disconnected from neural networks. You write down the, uh, the um, explicit representation of an exponential family, and it does, doesn't have anything to do with neural networks. Now I'm coming to neural networks, and I will mainly talk about uh, the restricted Boltzmann machine, which Luigi has introduced, not because I'm convinced that this is how our brain works. It's the one that we uh, understand best. So, mm -hmm. The Fisher metric itself, yeah, it is. I, I, I don't know. So we have the explicit formula for the Fisher metric. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
Yeah, so that work actually, I have to say, that work in, initiated, uh, we had many questions after, it's, as always, you finish a work and then you have many other problems. And uh, so the, uh, the geometry of the, of the polytopes that I have shown will be presented actually by, uh, by Guido Montefa. And the reinforcement learning problem, we continued studying it and gave rise to a, a, a work uh, which is going to be presented by Johannes Rau today. So let me talk about uh, restricted Boltzmann machines. So they are very simple to define. We have a bipartite graph. Um, n input node, uh, n visible nodes, and m uh, hidden nodes, and you consider this nice exponential family, Boltzmann-Gibbs distribution. Again, this uh, this is represented here graphically, and it's very nice. We understand it very well. But then you are only interested in the visible nodes, so you have to marginalize over all the hidden nodes. And this geometrically corresponds to projecting the exponential family to a lower dimensional space, and then it becomes ugly. So it's really a complicated geometric object. People try to characterize it in terms of polynomial equations and inequalities, and it's still an uh, unsolved problem. But what you can try to address is at least to uh, know the, uh, uh, to the dimension of that projected object, of the restricted Boltzmann machine. And uh, you can try to um, compute the dimension in terms of the number of parameters. So you would expect, or you would, so one natural choice for the dimension is the number of parameters that you have in the system. So you have m times n wij's, which corresponds to this, and then uh, M uh, HIs, which is the magnetization for the hidden nodes, and this is the magnetization of threshold values for the, for the visible nodes. So you have this number of parameters, but of course, if, you, if the number of parameters exceeds the number, the dimension of the simplex of probability distribution on the visible nodes, then it cannot increase anymore. So, this gives rise to the notion of an expected, the expected dimension of the restricted Boltzmann machine, which is the number of parameters until it reaches the maximal dimension. And uh, so it was an open problem until recently whether or not the expected dimension is actually the dimension of the restricted Boltzmann machine. It, the work started with uh, uh, this publication, Cueto, Morton, and uh, Sturmfels who uh, proved this equality for a particular choice of M and N, for class of, uh, of combinations M and N, and formulated this as a conjecture. And this conjecture has been uh, verified in this recent work by Guido Montefa and Jason Morton, which appeared this year. So it's, uh, I recommend reading that paper. It's a really fantastic paper, and it's, it uh, analyzes uh, the the, the uh, dimension or the geometry of projected uh, part, uh, of uh, of projections of exponential families of a particular kind, uh, incorporating restricted Boltzmann machines. So that's somehow good news, but one shouldn't be too optimistic. So the projected object uh, has the full dimension. It doesn't. Uh, uh, yeah. So if you if you uh, if you have as many, as many uh, parameters as the dimension of this simplex, then uh, the object has the full dimension. So you, you could um, think that this is enough for representing everything uh, on the visible nodes, but it turns out actually that uh, even though you have the maximal dimension, it's far from uh, covering the full simplex uh, of uh, visible distributions, um, yeah. So here's the necessary condition. If you want to cover the full simplex by the restricted Boltzmann machine, so by this projected object, the number of uh, parameters has to exceed the, uh, the dimension of that simplex. That's uh, referred to as parameter, parameter counting argument. And this leads to a number, necessary number of hidden nodes in order to uh, cover the full simplex. And you see it's, uh, you have this exponential number here. It's, uh, it uh, in 
it's quite large. So this does not mean that the, if you have this, that number of hidden nodes that you can represent everything. And in order to get a sufficient condition, let's have a look at this theorem. So we, we obtained this theorem in, again in collaboration with uh, Guido Bontofa and Johannes Rau. You first, you take an arbitrary model and let's say we have a probability distribution here and we measure the distance from that model. It's basically, it's this quantity here. And then we maximize that distance. So we, we uh, evaluate the maximal distance from that model. And that quantity somehow captures the uh, approximation, uh, the, um, uh, um, the quality of the model, how much it can actually uh, um, cover in the, in the simplex here. So it turns out that you can upper bound this um, maximum approximation error by this quantity, depending on the number of visible nodes and number of hidden nodes. And as a particular case, a particular implication, you can, say, you can ask for the number m for which this is zero. So the maximum approximation error uh, is zero if, I, I should rephrase this. So if the number of hidden nodes exceeds this number, then this will be zero. And this means that the closure of the restricted Boltzmann machine is the full simplex. So that's the sufficient condition here. Let me say a few words concerning this result here. It looks very simple, but it's quite hard. Uh, I started this research uh, with my PhD thesis, where I studied the uh, distance, the maximization of the distance from an exponential family. And uh, uh, Fero Matus got interested in this work, and uh, he uh, worked a lot on this. Later on, Johannes Rau uh, generalized uh, uh, obtained uh, very nice results in his PhD work. He studied uh, the same problem. And um, at the same time, uh, Guido Montefa was uh, finalizing his work and uh, they joined forces. He, Guido was working on, uh, on uh, restricted Boltzmann machines and uh, Johannes uh, had these nice results on the maximization of the information distance. And uh, that's the outcome. The problem was, that this object here is far from being an exponential family. So you have somehow to find nice, uh, nice geometric objects sitting in the restricted Boltzmann machine and uh, using results for these uh, uh, more uh, simpler models. So one last remark, because of this, uh, because of this, um, um, non-optimality, let's say, of the, of the evaluation of the distance here, it turns out that this uh, sufficient bound it can be uh, further improved, and that's uh, a very recent result by uh, uh, Guido and uh, Johannes. They uh, uh, f uh, discovered uh, a way to further improve this, uh, this number of hidden nodes. But in any case, so I described now the results for restricted Boltzmann machines. And what I'm going to do, uh, I said I'm working with, poly with the polytope of uh, policies. So the way, the way we use it, OK. Um, so this is how they are used as policies. You, s you subdivide the visible nodes in, uh, in uh, in uh, sensor nodes and actuator nodes, and now they can act as input-output devices. So you fix the sensor uh, states, and then you do uh, Gibbs, basically Gibbs sampling, iterate this several times, and then this will converge to a distribution over A, and that's the output of the system. So you can describe input-output relations by restricted Boltzmann machines, and we will use this as brains for embodied systems. 
So that's the general idea. And all results that I have shown to you for, uh, for the joint distributions, for the distributions, uh, can be extended to the, uh, to the conditional model. For example, we have here the necessary condition again, parameter counting argument. You get the number of, that's the number, the necessary number of hidden nodes so that you can generate all conditional distributions from 2 to the s, which is uh, k, to 2 to the uh, n. Okay, this then, uh, this is required in order to fill the polytope of uh, stochastic matrices. And in the same way, you can also uh, study sufficient conditions. Again, this uh, information uh, distance maximization, you get similar result. And this is the sufficient condition for, the, uh, for covering the full uh, polytope of uh, stochastic matrices. I'm not going into the details, but the picture is almost the same. Um, so the main message here is in order to represent everything, so the main message of the uh, cognitivistic approach is actually that you can model with neurons everything but you need an exponential number of nodes. So it's very attractive that you can uh, model everything, but it's, uh, it's not tractable because you need a huge number of nodes. So that's the main message, and you see it also here. We, we discover this, we, we get the same results. Um, on the other hand, in many applications, we have structured data. We don't need to represent everything. In particular, and that's my main example, if you have an embodied system, it has its embodiment constraints, and uh, you can try to use these embodiment constraints in order to, uh, to find, uh, to reduce this number of hidden nodes and perform as well as uh, a system with, uh, as well as a universal approximator. So I'm going to be more precise here. So, this refers to the notion of cheap control in, embodied, uh, uh, in the field of embodied uh, intelligence. And that's the main example here. So, we have two, uh, two um, case studies which demonstrate, or two examples which demonstrate the difference. So, in this example, one has tried to mimic the human walking behavior by uh, basically reproducing the trajectory of, uh, of, of the walking behavior. And you, you, you need a lot of computation here in order to control that, uh, that movement. And uh, so that's the ASIMO. It has been uh, developed. It took them like uh, 35 years in order to develop that, uh, um, to produce that behavior. And people were shocked when they were confronted with this example. You can mim mimic basically the same walking behavior without any brain. So this one does a lot of computation. This, this one doesn't even have a brain. So now what? Hmm? Interesting. <laughs> so what does that mean? Does it mean that we don't have brains? I mean, so these are two extreme examples, and the message is that, uh, I mean, there are many, many case studies demonstrating this, that in nature, uh, systems uh, exploit the properties of their body uh, as, uh, as much as, like, as they can. They are not without brains, but uh, they, have, uh, um, they try to control in a cheap way. So that's the main message. So to, to summarize this concept here, on the left-hand side, we have universal approximation. Here, that stands for cheap control. And given that we have many, many neurons, about 10 to the 10 neurons in our brain, we might be tempted to think that this corresponds to us, in particular, people that uh, uh, seem that uh, consider themselves as being the center of the universe, would like to have a universal approximator of, uh, as a brain. But I would, uh, 
like to think about it in this way, that this is the more realistic um, uh, interpretation of, of our brain. So let's formalize this. So I said we can try to reduce the computation uh, by exploiting the, the embodiment of the system, the embodiment constraints. And here we are, we are using an, a very simple geometric argument here. Um, so here's the world. It uh, makes transitions from W to W prime uh, based on the actuator values of the system. So the system takes some measurements, that's the, the sensors. It has its intrinsic policy, pi, and, uh, which gen generates uh, actuator outputs and they are sent to the world and the world makes a transition, okay? So now I said the behavior is taking place here in the, in the world. So let's consider the policy behavior map, which assigns to the policy, which is sitting here, the transition, that's the transition kernel in the world. So that can be considered as, uh, as, yeah, as a Markov kernel. Um, so we first take the measurement here, we apply the policy, and then we apply this uh, kernel alpha. And because we are just interested in W and W prime, in the transitions in the world, we sum, we marginalize out the states of the sensors and the states of the actuators. Okay, this is really the transition in the world. Now, if you have two policies that produce the same behavior, why should we represent both of them? Okay? So we can consider policies to be equivalent. So we have an equivalence relation. And it is sufficient to have a model that intersects with uh, every equivalence class at, let's say, uh, uh, once. And so this is done in the following way. We, if you consider this mapping here and consider beta and alpha to be fixed because they are the embodiment constraints, then this is an affine map. So you can evaluate the computer dimension of the image of that map. This is what we call embodiment dimension. And uh, instead of talking about the universal approximator, which I have done before, you can talk about an embodied universal approximator. If it can ge generate everything, um, So, so let, me, let me describe it here. That's, that's uh, this, um, the visualization of this idea here. So that's the uh, policy behavior map. It maps the polytope of all policies onto the space of behaviors. And there is a dimensionality reduction. Now, if you, if you want to represent the same uh, behaviors by a smaller dimensional model, it's sufficient to, for example, find such a model here which has the same projection. So that's the, that's the whole idea. And then you would call this model an embodied universal approximator. You can actually write down such a policy model explicitly. Um, and you only need, so that's an exponential family and the number of these uh, so-called feature vectors um, is just the dimension of this, uh, of this image here. But it turns out that the feature vectors can be quite complicated. So what we did was something different. We replaced the, the general, the exponential family model by this condition restricted Bolson machine. So this is how it works. So you have the, uh, um, the condition restricted Boltzmann machines, machine. It receives some sensor input, you fix it. And then you do Gibbs sampling, and after a few steps, you read out the output and send it to the world. And now the question is, what is the minimal number, or a sufficient number of hidden nodes, so that uh, the, uh, the image of the corresponding condition-restricted Boltzmann machine is the same as the image of the full polytope? So that's the, that's the uh, question, and here's the answer. Let me ignore S beta for a second. 
So if you consider, if you want to model all policies from the input to the output, we had this uh, exponential number, which is again here. So we need a huge number of, uh, of nodes. But if you want to have an embodied universal approximator, it's sufficient to have that many uh, hidden nodes, where the embodiment dimension appears here, okay? And the S beta is basically the, the uh, set of all sensor states that can be measured by the system. Because of the embodiment constraints, you have this uh, uh, reduced number of, uh, of such sensor states. So we tested this in a case study, and that's the final part of my talk. Here's the case study. N. N, the number N. Here, yeah. it doesn't. Mm. Yeah, it does. So it's, uh, it, it, this, it's uh, the only important thing is the embodiment dimension. Mm. Uh, yeah. N Again, please. The number N, it appears in this dimension. Not explicitly. Can, this embodiment dimension can be very small. So you will, you will see it in, in this case study. So this is the case study that we consider the hexapod. Um, so it has uh, uh, six legs. Each leg has uh, two degrees of freedom, the shoulder and the knee. Uh, that's the angular range of uh, shoulder or knee. And uh, in order to deal with, restri with restricted Boltzmann machines, we discretize the full ra uh, angular range uh, into 16 states. And each state is modeled by a binary vector of length four. So we have these states. Um, so this is this four. For each leg, you, had you have two degrees of freedom. So you multiply them by two. And because of the six legs, you multiply them by six. So you get 48 neurons for the sensors. And the same number of neurons for the actuators. And this full space of a uh, set of, uh, of states of the system is 2 to the 48. So it's a huge number of states. And what we wanted to model, we wanted to model that behavior, walking behavior. This is not generated by restricted Boltzmann machine. This is a walking behavior that we set from outside. It's a uh, a tripod walking gate, and it's easy to implement. So that's what we want the system to do with a Boltzmann machine. And what we did, uh, we tried to use our theory, our bounds. Uh, we measured the, uh, all sensors. So here, the frequency of, this, of the states. So I said we have 2 to the 48 states. But of course, they are not, uh, not all of them are um, are measured, and that's the distribution of these states. And um, we uh, considered the cutoff here. We removed 20% of these states. So that's, that's the number of S beta. This cutoff from 100% to 80%, that's something not justified by theory. We did it like that. Uh, so, so that's the cutoff. This gives us a number, um, so we realize that uh, if we just consider 80% of the data, we uh, only uh, have 63 uh, states. So that's the 63 here. We computed the embodiment dimension, which turns out to be three for this walking behavior, and then minus one. So our bound uh, reduces to 65 here. So the number of hidden nodes that our theory predicts that are sufficient to, to generate that walking behavior is 65. If you consider the number that you get from your, for universal approximation is 10 to the 14. There's quite some difference. So it's a huge reduction by, just, by exploiting the, the constraints of the body. And let's test it. So let's, just as a um, joke, Let's test, uh, give the, the agent just five neurons. It's much less than the 65 that we predicted. Mm -hmm. Let's see what it can do with five neurons. So here are the sensors, here are the actuators. 
You see this transparent body here, that's the reference behavior which we want to model. But that's the actual guy who tries to mimic this as good as it can with just five neurons. So you see the neurons here in action, so that's Gibbs sampling, and this generates this, this behavior. So this poor guy is not able to mimic, uh, to generate that walking behavior. Now let's go to the 65 neurons. That's what our theory predicted. So we have the 65 hidden nodes. And you see the, there's only a small difference. And it turns out, you will see in a second, that this difference is not because of the 65. Even if you take 1,000, it will not change. You will have a difference because the walking behavior that you want to generate cannot be represented in a better way with a restricted Boston machine. So it works quite well. And that's the analysis, the full analysis. So we went up to 100 hidden nodes. We started with, that's the quality. The quality is plotted here. The quality is the distance after 30 seconds in meters. So when you start with five neurons, it doesn't do, perform very well, which we have seen. If you go to 65, it has already the optimal performance. You might argue that it's uh, even a little bit less, but uh, I mean, we are comparing here two to the 14 with 65. So you see that the theory predicts quite well how many neurons we need in order to exploit the properties of, of the body, and it's a huge reduction. So I was quite uh, satisfied with this uh, outcome, and we are now trying to extend this analysis to other morphologies, and let me finish my talk by showing you this nice creature here. So that's one of the candidates uh, we are playing around with ants and all kinds of creatures, and that's one creature that we want to use in order to do the same analysis. And I want to finish my talk with a list of papers. So I was talking about mentioning the information maximization uh, problem. This is the list of papers uh, on that problem. The geometry of uh, neural networks, in particular the restricted Boltzmann machines, are mainly uh, uh, obtained by Guido Montufar, who is going to give a talk, but he's talking, uh, going to talk about something different. And these are the works on uh, uh, embodied intelligence. And uh, I have to mention also uh, Kian Ghazi Zahedi, who is uh, at the moment at the Santa Fe Institute. He is doing all these virtual robotics uh, uh, stuff and uh, uh, studying morphological computation and all of that. So thank you very much. We are quite late on the program, so we have just time for one or two questions, and then we will go to lunch and continue the discussion. So, I, okay. I didn't understand your cutoff. What is really your cutoff with 80% of the data? Well, I don't know. Um, so the thing is, we have two to the 48 possible states. So while, while the agent is moving, you can, uh, you can observe the sensor states, and uh, there are too many sensor states. And uh, so we order them according to their frequency, and at some point we have to cut off in, uh, in order to, we have to interpret at some point the remaining ones with low frequency as being noise. And if we don't do that, so if you don't do that, then we, we cannot, we cannot uh, so we will have a, a number of hidden nodes that is uh, too large. In some sense, you can say, okay, if you put the cutoff somewhere else, you will get a much larger number than 65. Mm -hmm. So if you in a, restated this in a weaker form, is if you do the cutoff with 80%, you get this nice 65. But if you don't do that cut off, the, the um, bounds are not sharp enough to give you these low numbers. So we, tried, we are trying to, f to find justifications uh, to solve this problem where to, theoretically, where the, to do the cut off, where the noise starts, so to say. Because you, you uh, speak about the number of uh, neurons which, we, which animals have. 
and <coughs> they are concentrated in some region. Okay, for example, in the cerebellum, okay, you have a very a huge number of neurons okay, for every animal, and so there is several functions. Okay, and one of them is to uh, adapt correctly in time, okay, uh, the, the motion. Okay, it has to be accurate in time. Okay. Other hypothesis is that they is for to learn new uh, kind of movement. Okay. So can you recover such kind of uh, necessity that uh, adaptation in time, for example, needs a very large number of neurons? Okay. Adaptation in? In time, that is to, to be very accurate in time. To, to when we do a movement, it's very mm -hmm. continuous okay, and uh, very uh, smooth at the, at the end. Yeah. Um, I mean, that's a difficult question. So the only thing I want to say is that um, we didn't consider learning here. What I have shown to you is how close can I come to the optimal behavior if I... Uh, so the, the, the simulations that I have shown to you is the outcome of the, uh, of the best perfor performer, uh, so to say. We didn't, in this context, we didn't apply any learning algorithm. We didn't pay attention to the learning algorithm. So we used some learning algorithm in order to find the best performer. But uh, I deeply believe that uh, something like the natural gradient method should be implemented, but we didn't do that. Um, concerning uh, other behaviors, it's really an interesting problem. Uh, if you, if you uh, want to learn a different behavior, if you can do this uh, with the same network, with the same number of nodes. And uh, so if you, if you train the system for some behavior and then train it for a different behavior, then it will forget the first behavior. So you could say, okay, I have a number of different networks. So the first network uh, uh, controls the first behavior, the second network, the second behavior, and so on. And it's really a difficult problem to find a way to learn all these behaviors and to represent them in the same network. So that's a very important problem. Just a question of uh, your first slide, of your part, not uh, of the talk, but of your part, with uh, this one, uh, uh, of your uh, of your program of research with uh, different. Uh, this? Uh, no, no. Well, after information geometry, uh, when you start, uh, when you have the, the evolution of the world on. Uh, ah. This one. Yes, yes, this one. So in this uh, chain, you, you have sensors on, or only actuators in, your, uh, in, the, in the different loop. You have sensors on actuators? On, on, on yes. The act yes. Yeah. And you have addressed sensors on actuators in uh, use cases or for the time? Because in your example, you have only actuators. You have no... So no, no, the loop. sensors, so, so the, the, the uh, uh, angles of the shoulder and, and the knee okay. uh, can be measured by the system. Okay. Okay, so that's, that's the sensors. Yeah. This is the idea of Poincaré, that we, we, learn, we, learn, uh, we learn the 3D by the, by the or, uh, arm on, uh, on the muscle uh, information to the brain. So, uh, I don't know about that. <laughs> okay, thank you. So thanks to the thank you. speaker again. Thank you.